fiercely pursuing accountability on policy and implementation. It's time for another DJ Elf 7 candidate interview. Yo, what's up, boy? DJ Elf 7. As you know, I'm doing my run of candidates, checking out a whole bunch of them, and we have one of them today. I'll let him introduce himself, though. Go ahead. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Barbarino, and I am running for a U.S. Senate and uh, midterm elections coming up in a couple of months uh, against the little known incumbent, uh, you know, Marco Rubio. I am an independent, so you're often going to probably, you know, hear people dismissing me as the fringe candidate that's just looking to steal votes, um, but that is not the case. I'm okay. just a regular guy who decided to, to want it to affect change. So we look at uh, uh, we look at Florida. What Florida is known for, like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, known for having corruption issues, known for having, you know, wacky elections, stuff like that. So, yes. um, you know, we take a look at um, why why you decide to go independent versus like sometimes here uh, people go Republican, right? Why you decide to go independent versus um, that route? Well, so I I, I think that uh, there's a, a dichotomy of Habs did have a significant and profound effect on our lives. And uh, because of that, this, you know, the yin and the yang, the white, the black, the good, the bad, uh, we're constantly st stuck in this tug of war of having to decide which side to choose. And life isn't black and white, man. And there isn't, I can't say that I'm on one side for anything, right? And it'd be hypocritical of me to, to pick a side because I'm not, you know, uh, I agree with both sides. And honestly, I think that going forward, uh, we should demand that um, our elected officials are independent and they're not beholden to any specific party. That's good. Well, actually, I'm a supporter of third party independent uh, candidates. Uh, I'm running a program right now to help them, you know, band together in a way. So very excited to meet you. And thank you for taking, course, the, uh, you know, going independent is a difficult route and a uh, principled route, right? So... You have absolutely it is so i appreciate that so um what uh brought you into the field what what made you want to run for senate the thing is we look at house of representatives a lot of people say that might be easier race more local race senate is kind of like a larger race right yeah more difficult race to win um what gives you the right what's the background that you have to run for this position so um i think there's uh a, a general belief that to get into a race like this, you have to be if someone of esteem, you know, uh, of, of wealth, if extremely well connected. Um, I'm, I'm a I'm a diehard on you know the principles of the Constitution, and you know uh, the government is for the people by the people. That's what we the people stand for. And when you take a look at where we're at, and I can say in my 40 years of living here in the United States. Uh, it hasn't been progress. And the one thing that we can, you know, definitely point out with our elected officials is that it's been a very specific type of person. And that hasn't worked. So, it's not working. So, so we I need guess, to eliminate those barriers. So I guess the question for you would be, like, I know, like, you could have a position, right? But uh, what's your, so I want to see your ability to get it done. So, like, some people, when I ask them, like, what's this, what are you most proud of, like, accomplishing, right? And if they say my kids or something, like that, I'll be like, nah, I wasn't really interested in that. Like, not that you're, because are interesting, but really what I mean by that is, as in terms of relation towards this job specifically, right, towards being a senator, right, maybe you've done something in governance or maybe something in management, right, what are you most proud of accomplishing that shows us your, um, your skills or your know, relevant skills towards this job? I hope that makes sense. So, yeah, absolutely it does. Um, for my, my, you know, my career spans uh, 20 plus years. Uh, I started working when I was 17 years old. Obviously, I did the typical real retail. Um, but I was fortunate that I got involved in the information and communication and technology sector. Cool. Literally when the internet was being born. Um, I ended up selling, working for Bell South and selling Frame Relay and you know, DSL when it was 1.54 megs. So I'm an infrastructure guy. I'm an engineer. Um, I went from working out in the field, you know, to doing installs and running cables and all that to actually selling because I'm a pretty technical, I'm a, I'm a total nerd. So I get lost in the details and the specs. And that led me to transition from the communication sector into the technology sector, right when Microsoft had created their certification program. I spent probably about, you know, seven years as a systems administrator, a systems engineer, working a myriad of projects. Um, among those was uh, several projects for the government. I was hired by Amadeus, 
which is the airline reservation system as a network engineer. And that process took like literally two months because you had to pass FAA, FBI, all the background checks. And we're finally in, you know, in training and a plane hits the tower. So that was my first experience with something catastrophic that was out of your control. Okay. And it, it literally ruined my career because all of a sudden, you know, I had no job. Uh, I was able, you know, to get a couple projects and I ended up working for Bank of America on an IT project for two years. After that, um, I finished the state. They wanted me to travel. Um, my daughter was going to be born and I couldn't. And once again, I found myself unemployed. And through that, it's like every time that I found myself unemployed after five or seven years, you know, I started to question, is it really me or is, you know, is it the system? Why did you lose but your you job also after, don't, yeah, why did you lose your job after the plane hit the tower? Well, so it was the airline industry and we were in training and the company decided that it was going to put the project on hold first okay. and really kind of see where it was going. But, you know, that hold ultimately, you know, after three weeks of us sitting at home doing nothing, uh, you know, we got the call from at that time it was EDS, you know, letting us know, hey, listen, you, you have know, good experience? It, we're, we're you just... have good experience. I mean, was it hard for no engineers to find a job at the time or was that during? Uh... So, you know, early 2000, it wasn't. There was a plethora of work. And, you know, for an uneducated immigrant with a certification making 60 grand, you know, at 20 years old, 23 years old, that was good money, man. Um, and, and I think that it kind of highlights, well, you know, one of my biggest issues is that, you know, society has literally told an entire generation that without an education, you're not going to make it anywhere. I believe education is important, but that said, I don't believe college is for everyone. And I think my experience with that, you know, succeeding, um, you know, being fortunate enough with certifications um, is important because uh, there's a whole bunch of society right now that's kind of lost. There's a lot of debt that is crippling the rest of society. Okay. Um, so onto that, I went into healthcare, I spent eight years in healthcare. Um, you know, healthcare in Florida is uh, extremely difficult. It's also one of the top fraud markets. And I was in it at a time where HIV was one of the biggest items, uh, you know, for fraud. And I got swept up into that through, uh, you know, no fault of mine. I purchased a practice from a retiring doctor. And within two years of me billing, you know, what he was billing, uh, United Healthcare flagged me as, you know, uh, suspicious. They held my money for more than six months and they choked me. They put me out of business. And that really, was the one time that, I mean, it, it, it killed me because, so what does that you mean? know, I made my you first. Bought, you bought his debt or so, like, what do you mean he bought his practice? Like, So in healthcare, you can't, the, the, the only tangible there is the patient and you can't buy a patient, it's illegal. Okay. So what you're doing is you're, you take over his staff and you hope that the patient stays. So it's a big risk. Um, okay. So I purchased his practice, took on his employees and, you know, started seeing his patients. But what happens is, is that um, it, and everything is, 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 is a bill with the government. And it really wasn't Medicare or Medicaid that I was billing to and had so a problem you were with. It was doctors. A, you just hired a new doctor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had a general practice. Uh, I, had a, um, I had a medical director, physician assistant, and a couple of the doctors. And I was fortunate enough to also be involved in part of a teaching where um, one of the schools from New York would send in candidates. Uh, like I said, it was it was very successful. I made my first million, and and just like that, it was gone, man. And I lost it right in you know 2008 when the crisis hit, and it was a huge hit, man. It, it, I mean, it really, really, you know, I thought of suicide. It's something that I didn't discuss about, you know, discuss with people till later on. Um, but it really left a bad taste, you know, um, with the system. I really felt that. Uh, even though I understood that, you know, um, it was high fraud and all of that. that well, Carlos, you know, I'll tell you something you and me have in common. The thing is that you've been at the top and you've been on the bottom. And the fact oh, yeah. that, that really opens your eyes on both ways, right? So you can be, you can relate to both sides in ways that a lot of other people can. So I definitely, yeah. and also being around the entertainment business, you know, like we were around the poor people and the rich people at the same time. So yes. it's a, it's an interesting, um, that's very cool. So um, it's uh yeah, yeah I, I can I can see how your perspective would be, you know, broader in certain in certain respects. Yeah. Well, it gets even better because after healthcare, which is all white collar, 
um, I was fortunate to end up in the automotive industry. And October of COVID would have been my 10th year in the automotive industry. Wow. And you do? it, you know, COVID, COVID destroyed it, man. It destroyed it. The, the automotive industry was already limping on one leg and COVID came in and decimated it. And I have a lot of colleagues that are, you know, the six figure guys that were out on the field that can't find work. And I was already working on my exit strategy. And this was kind of, you know, part of that plan uh, because I'm 40, so I'm going to be 47 in June. And when you reach a certain age and a certain, you know, level of income, you, you literally work yourself out of work because nobody wants to hire you. Just and so you know, I'm your age actually, yeah? So all, like yeah, Netscape, no kidding. Netscape, Navigator, AOL, I get all those references. All of that? You got mail, I know what you're talking <laughs> Good. about. There was a movie, man, I remember Good, that. man. Remember that, you got mail? <laughs> I remember that, yeah. Absolutely, I do yeah, with, I um, um, with uh, was it Tom Hanks? Something, and, um, something like that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, it's funny because a lot of people, like, you tell them that, and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm from that era, bro. <laughs> Netscape Navigator, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the OG. So yeah. Gen X? GeoCities. So, you know, one of the, yeah, what, what are the, well, I Muds? used to work, Did I don't know if months? you remember. Do months? Anyway, that's, no, no, but I don't do you remember MyCity.com? Uh, do you remember no. MyCity.com? No. So MyCity.com was like this huge, like, portal for everything city related. Oh. It was a South Beach company. I worked for that company, and. It was during like the dot com debacle. Yo, I have so that bubble today. burst. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Crazy times. Crazy times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyways. They were good so, though. Okay. I they usually have uh, political partners that I work with, right? I am a small coalition type of guy. So I want to ask their questions first. So the first thing is uh, do you, you know who Julian Assange is? Do you support Assange? So I do know who he is. Um, and I do believe I'm a huge proponent of whistleblower. Um, because that leads into rules and regulations. And I think one of the biggest problems that we, you know, are experiencing societal wise is the fact that, you know, there's a lax in regulations and, you know, whether it's an individual or a corporation, um, there's too much abuse. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a huge proponent. Now that said, you know, when you're leaking information like that, you, you got to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Right. Okay. You know, it's not just, you know, you feel that, you know, you disagree with someone and you're just going to dump stuff, you know, no. But um, if it is something, you know, that was is, is being done wrong and does have a profound effect on society, absolutely, I agree with it. So, yeah. So you would be for freeing Assange? Freeing him? Um, you know, he's not here anymore. Uh, so I always tell Actually, people. Okay, they, they, um, they did successfully do the extradition. They're fighting the extradition. But the extradition well, right, they're fighting the extradition. Yeah, right, right scheduled to come here right so he's in ecuador last i heard right he's still hiding out in oh, ecuador he's actually in england now i believe Belmont. he's in england now okay Belmont. yeah yeah so people always ask me about uh, international affairs um you know being nicaraguan obviously uh you know i did experience that during the reagan years yeah. but i always tell people look we need to start taking care of our house first before we can start taking our care of our neighbors and it's not that um, I'm completely disconnected from what's going on to certain issues. I get that. I get I just that. Feel, I just feel stuff. there's so many issues. Yeah, I man. I get that. I yeah. get that, too. No, there, there's actually a real, there's there's legitimacy there. So all these yeah. entrepreneurs there who want to say something about that, um, there's there's the guy, too. Right? He's not the only guy out there. He's just represents some of yeah. us. Yeah. So that's cool. I, yeah. I respect that. Okay. Let's go on to the, um, the second one, UBI. You may have heard of Universal Basic Income. Are you supporting UBI yes. or yes? Okay, appreciate that. I do, and I and 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 I actually talk about it because um, there's been several studies on it, and there was um, one study that was actually um, one that I read in detail, and it was in California, where they were given um, I think it was eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Every single person that they gave that money, that basic income, did something good with it. So the fear mongering. That goes on that you know you're gonna give somebody money and they're gonna turn into drugs and alcohol none of that happened none of it and the reason why i believe in it is because i mean take a look at where we're at man you know uh, what does minimum wage cover now yeah and we need to do something about it so if, if if we're not gonna raise wages then we need to provide some sort of stipend and i think honestly we need to do both yeah i like that answer best yeah the last one all right so Let's move on from UBI. Now, the thing is that uh, another group that I work with is the disabled community. And people with disabilities right now, 
there's uh, if we look at minimum wage we could think about maybe a subsistence wage uh, but the thing is that they're allowed to be paid sub minimum wage would you be uh for, yes uh, yeah you would be for support with disability people getting minimum i appreciate that yeah at least yeah okay we're gonna move absolutely on. man be, listen whether whether you're disabled or you're poor everybody wants a chance and an opportunity to work and be productive man and 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 this thought that you know people are just lazy we're not inherent no one is inherently lazy man you know maybe there's a small percentage that are but the majority are good people that want an opportunity to earn a living so let's provide that yeah plain and simple yeah another um community that i do work with is the trans community so let's take a look yes. at some of their issues right now so the thing is we look at trans people and they might not have a job you know because they face a lot of discrimination that you know i get that right, right. not saying i approve but i get it um, and then what happens if they find themselves like, you know, poor and destitute and in need of public housing. Now, let's say present, let's say, for example, we're looking at the numbers and we say 10% of the people going towards public housing applying are trans people. But when we look at the actual number of people who get in, it's only 2%. Maybe they're encouraged to leave by getting beat up by mass people or someone pees on the door. Who knows what's going on, right? They get harassed in some way and right, they just end up not and moving out. So... The thing is that there's no law that says you can discriminate against these people, but that's what happens anyways. What can you do to help protect this community? Um, I'm, look, I believe in equality 100%. I've been an ally. Um, I, t I took, you know, we took our kids to a gay parade and people couldn't believe it because sure. we were there with seven, eight year old kids. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't believe that anyone has the right to tell anyone how to live their lives. You know, um, one of the greatest things about this country is our ability to do what we want and, you know, without repercussion and without any sort of hatred. Unfortunately, that's not the way that it is. So I support any measure that can help anyone live a, a meaningful and productive life, man, regardless of race, color or creed. Yeah. So there's some interesting angles on this question that like, uh, you know, go a little deeper. Right. So, for example, we could say, right. for instance, right. Remember, I said 10 percent or 2%, right. so there's the idea of quotas coming into play to try to correct the issue, right? But then, you know, can you trust the numbers? There's another idea sometimes people that have said, like, maybe we could take all the people and maybe like a sectioned off housing for them, but that could be considered ghettoization. Can you imagine how controversial it would be to take all the black people and say, we're gonna put them in one building, right, in this one community, yeah. that would be very controversial, right? So, yeah. and quotas themselves are controversial. So there's, um, do you have any thoughts, right, considering those particular aspects? There's some complex ones there about how to address some of these issues for this community. Was well, there, first right, of all, do you think quotas if, are if a there's solution? A, maybe not, right? Maybe no, 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 no. If 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 there's a quota, it has to be a financial quota because there's no much budget. Okay. Right? It's not because we're discriminating because of color, race, or creed. That that's flat out discrimination, even if it comes with gender identity or anything like that. Uh, so you how, know, how a quota right? should be financially. Period. I'm not pushing quotas, but how? Right? It could be any solution, right? But how are you going to make sure that this community, right, gets more stuff? Get gets what's fair. Well, so you know that that it all falls under HUD and HUD, well, you know, Housing and Urban Development. Um, Every, every governmental agency requires some checks and balance. Yes. So it's not a matter of just setting up a program. It's a matter, what I believe that we should be implementing are citizen patrols, right? Some sort of, uh, sort of like, think of the community council. Yeah. We should have citizens, right, in the community that are allowed to audit these companies to ensure that well, our that's tax right. dollars. That's actually, yeah. One, yeah, one of the big things that I promote right there. I like that idea a lot. Yeah, that our tax dollars are, be, are being spent. Right. And, and why, can, why shouldn't it be the people that live there? It's, it's, it's our money, man. It's, it's, it's our tax be, dollars. Actually. It's gotta be right. That's, yeah. that's the central right. element, right? Instead of having some Absolutely. kind of like manager who never lives in the neighborhood, never been there in their life. Right. Yeah. The people right. that are impacted right. by the changes need to be able to have uh, some voice in that. So thank you so much. That's exactly the whole Absolutely. right there. Yeah. So that's really cool, man. Uh, I know that was a tough question right there. Cause all the, right? <laughs> nah, everybody man. has their area of expertise, right? Yeah. But that yeah. was, uh, Another one that I'm going to ask about, right, because we have a lot of people that we work with um, or, or supporting, right? This is just so, uh, one that I support. Have you heard of something called Right to Repair? Yes, absolutely. So I'm a huge DIY man. Okay. Do you support, so <laughs> and do you support Right to Repair? Absolutely. Cool. I own it. 
So, yeah. so right now, my, my, my parents were going to junk, um, you oh, know, my mom was going to junk my yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a 2003 Jaguar, you know, and the software, I had to get the software like everybody else through a forum. You know, it's, uh, you know, one of these, uh, you know, temporary ones that'll last 90 days because there's absolutely no way that it's cost effective to take that car into the dealer for have diagnostics. You, have you heard of Lewis Rossman? No, I don't think I have. I'm a fan of his work. He's actually another activist that works on the right to repair stuff. It's, I, you know. Yeah. Wait, but is he the is he the one that spearheaded it though? The spearheaded the the lawsuit. Well, the thing is that I think the loss there's actually a multiple of them going on. Um, one of them right. is going to be from like the uh, the John Deere farmers, which actually is quite. Uh, I think they're doing pretty successful there. Also, Biden right. because the military right was uh, the military wasn't able to repair their vehicles because the right to repair right the. the companies right. had to muscle in on it so yeah right biden said fuck that he, he shut that shit down there's an yeah. executive order but the thing is that still the cell phones right that's what lewis rossman does like the iphones and stuff um that industry is being allowed to be complete you before, remember the old movies when you'd be in the spy movie they could rip the, the battery out the phone you can't do that <laughs> that's no how more. i that, that's how that. i started yeah. and when i got into systems engineering yeah there are certain people are like, oh, what computer should I buy? I'm like, listen, don't buy a Dell. Yeah. Right. And don't buy Apple. Why? Because they solder their chips and you can't repair them. Yeah. So you've all automatically reduced the life of that. Right. The, the plan obsolescence. And, and I get I get that, you know, they're, they're out to make money. But why are you going to prevent anyone from repairing a product that you don't even carry anymore or not even interested in selling? So the right to repair absolutely, you know, is crucial. Now, if I fuck it up, I fuck it up. I don't have any right to bring that phone in. I, I, I damaged it, right? So one of my certifications was A plus certification where I could literally cut the warranty sticker on any, you know, uh, electrical equipment and not void the warranty because that certification with computers. And that helped me become employed. Fast forward 20 years, people aren't repairing computers anymore. They're throwing them away and getting a new one. You know, and I think that kind of lends to where society is at. We're just used to throwing things away and not taking the time, you know, to explore, investigate, learn about, you know, some of these components. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So um, those are most of the partners that I work with, um, and we're going to be covering more of them at the Unified Platform for 22. Um, so different people come in with different um, expertises. You come with a wide range of, right. uh, you know, uh, backgrounds, I say uh, the business startup type thing and the technology side is uh, definitely appreciated. Um, so now I'm going to cover some more general issues that people just probably like on the mind, right? So this, yeah, is, this is probably so played out, right? So I talk about it, but the COVID thing, right? Reopening, what's your thoughts about just that general subject? That's a hot topic. It, it is a hot topic. And here's my, my personal belief. Um, I am a science guy. So I understand the effectiveness or the efficacy of vaccines. Um, so I was vaccinated myself and I, I had to do it to get into school. I have no problem with that. Okay. Um, I think there's a larger behavioral question that we need to address with society. And that's that no matter what, you're not gonna force anyone to do anything, right? And I think we need to start picking our battles and fighting the good fight, like John Lewis said, instead of the bad fight. And the bad fights are exercises in futility. If someone doesn't want to get vaccinated, well, fuck them, bro, move on. It's time to move on. Like, what, what are we going to do? We're going to continue wasting on this person who doesn't want to get vaccinated. Get vaccinated, get yourself healthy, make your personal decision. But it's time to move on from that. I do understand where harsh, the bro. mandates I, I, come in. I get, I get yeah, I, no, I, it's, it's yeah. what are we going to do? Right. Like, I, it, I mean, right, yeah. we're going to continue yeah. to fight with somebody that doesn't want to be vaccinated. Yeah. Like it's, we have to move on to better things, man, because it, yeah. we're never going to progress in the end. Right. You, you everybody know? has their own consent. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We have to respect yeah. consent. Yeah. So, yeah. That's cool, man. All right. Appreciate that. Overall, I do agree with sentiment. No, no problem. hundred um, percent. I do get it. Sometimes by printing that way, it's more acceptable to people that are just really violently against the idea of others. <laughs> you're just, you're just not going to convince that person, dude. And you know, that, yeah. it's time to move on, bro. <laughs> yeah, I get that. So let's, um, so, okay. What other topic? Okay. So the thing is that it kind of settled down, but police reform is kind of like another topic that comes up, you know, flares up over the summers, right? Yeah. Well, last summer, right? So what, what's your, uh, you have any particular positions on that or ideas? Well, absolutely. We need justice reform, period. Okay. 
And that goes back into rules and regulations. Um, you know, if everyone's get the government off my hands, but then when something goes wrong is where the hell is the government doing their job? And there is no organization. Um, let me put it to you this way. I am vehemently against self-policing. And self-policing does just, it just isn't relegated to police. It's relegated to attorneys, the American bar. Yeah. It's relegated to physicians, the American Medical Association. Right? I can go on and on. Self-policing and self-governance is directly responsible for the, the plethora of issues that we have today. Because look at, look at what happened with Boeing. You know, a great company. I mean, it was the beacon of America. The minute they merged with McDougall, you know, Douglas, they became all about the stock. They threw away their safety book. They cut cost. And then look what happened. How did that happen? Because of lacks of regulations. Why? Because self-policing. So I don't I don't agree with anyone or any organization being their ultimate you know authority on what they can or cannot do, uh, the, and that's where my citizen panels come in. I think we're the, I think we as a community need to get involved, not just in the police, but who are your judges? Right? Who are you electing to the bench? These people have a profound effect on your daily lives. Everyone's busy talking about cops, but what about the attorneys that promulgate the majority of this stuff? What about the judges? You know, there's law and then there's reality. And the reality is that when, no matter what crime you've committed or may have committed, when you get to court, look what happened right now. Who made the final decision? The judge. Even though this person was convicted of a crime by the jury of the peers, the judge decides to go against the rules and based on her opinion, order a lower sentence. How are we gonna change that, right? Who polices them? So that for me is a huge issue, man. And we need to set up these, you know, citizen panels to control that, cool. to regulate it. I like the idea of citizen panels, yeah? So, um, yeah. yeah, we actually had that discussion here in New York City. Um, we had actually a, um, a discussion with, uh, right, with police, uh, police uh, officers, stuff like that, and they said that the level of, because we're asking, right, some people say that they want the community panels to influence the captain of the precinct. But they were like, nah, they wanted to have the um, have it influence all the way to the top. They were like all the way to the commissioner because they're like, if, if you don't have the um, panels able to influence all the way to the top, then you cannot, um, they, they still answer to that guy. So you need that control. At that well, level. I, yeah, I, absolutely. Look, and, and, and it's a catch 22 because, you know, you do have to provide some autonomy. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I use this all the time. Lord Byron said it best, you know, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And there has to be checks and balances. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Yeah, this is a cop saying this, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Everyone, listen, man, this whole thing where, you know, all cops are bad, I don't, I don't generalize anyone or anything. You know, there's, there, you know, there's always a bad apple and it doesn't mean that we're allowed to because of that one bad cop. That, yes, are there a lot of bad cops? Yeah, but then we need to take a look at the hiring process. Yeah. You know, what happened there? And, you know, those are deeper issues, but we can't blame law enforcement for every singular issue that we have. Okay. It's not just their fault, man. It's the entire justice system. Appreciate you know, go talk to any police officer and they'll tell you, listen, man, we lock them up. The attorneys let them out and the judges let them out. You know, actually, big right? shout out uh, right now. Uh, this is actually March 28th. There's an event coming up with uh, my man. I just want to mention my account, Nolan Farrell and also uh, Reverend Keith. They're going to be outside the Queen Supreme Court. They actually have proof of their innocence but the fact of the matter is that they are actually um because the government stands to lose if they overturn the conviction right they're, so they're battling of it course. Out. we're gonna be there so you're right well, good luck to them themselves, yeah it's like you know they have something yeah. to lose if they admit the culpability right so of course they're, fi of they're course. finding ways to delay that which is <laughs> yeah it's yeah. unfortunate yeah so shout out to yeah. nolan pharrell we'll be there for you baby all right um hey so i, I looked at your website it's really cool um share the website again with our audience so it's uh, carlosforsenate.com. Okay. And that's actually, um, uh, I see the background. That's like your website, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the hero for it, um, the main page. And, you know, so you asked him at the beginning, you know, what qualifications do you have to get in this? And, and I don't. And I want to I want to make that very clear. Um, there's nothing special. I'm your garden variety neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. But what I wanted to do is take my experience, Ooh, okay. you know, with, throughout my career, specifically with technology, and show people that it can be done. You can run in a race 
without the hundreds of millions of dollars, because I think that is disgusting. And, you know, I think it's indicative of, um, you know, the, the deep and moral, you know, turpitude this society has where we can spend billions on elections and we get nowhere. Yeah. Well, right. So you could be normal, you know, but I want to see how you're exceptional. Wait a second. Okay. I do have a question about that right there. Sure. Shoot, man. Because shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> being normal in some ways is okay. But in some ways we need someone exceptional. So the fact of the matter is that all these one of the mill politicians, what they do is they sell out. Right. Yeah. So the thing well, is of that, course. Yeah. So the thing is that one thing that I really look for is people that can, you know, have a nose for corruption because that's really a huge problem up there. You know what I mean? So do you know about any corruption that you can talk about? Or, like, you know, why can we trust you to fight the corruption? Absolutely, man. Eight like years in health care. Normal guys will give up, right? Normal, normal guys give no. up. No. Go ahead. So what's up? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm relentless in that, man. So um, I'll give you an example. So I worked for this government program. Uh, that use the regional extension centers and regional extensions were created back um, during the agricultural period and basically it's exactly what it sounds like a regional extension center it was you know in rural communities and the purpose of that extension well uh, you froze on me yeah you froze on me can you hear me can you hear me extension center was to yeah wait, wait, you're, you're, you're freezing you're up. up you're breaking up you're breaking up give me uh oh yeah Okay, uh -oh. I'm about to run speedtest.net. Give me a second, yeah? Sure. What about you? Do you want to do the same thing? Let me take a look at what's going on here. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a crazy time right now. Are you, are, you, um, are you streaming live right now too? No. No? No, I'm just recording. So you're just recording? Yeah. How are you connected to? It seems to have improved. It seems to have improved. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it was an update surge or some shit. You know, Windows needs yeah. an update or some stupid stuff. I'm not check this. Yeah. <laughs> we good now. We good. Okay. I'm still recording. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Where was we again? All right. So we were talking about um, regional extension centers. Oh yeah. Regional and my experience with them. Yeah. So I worked on part of the High Tech Act, and the High Tech Act was during. Wait, wait um, you said regional extension centers is like part of like an agricultural thing. So what? Like they need to. It was founded. So they it was founded. Field or they were. So you're growing like it, crops were, and you're like, oh, we need like 20 more bushels of corn. So we're going to extend the field or something. Was that what it is? No, 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 no. So think of um, an extension center, sort of like a, a clinic, but not to not for patients, but more for to help the farmers and anyone in agriculture understand and navigate the complexities and programs that were being offered at the time. All right. It was basically to educate them. That was how that's how they were founded. Okay. It, what the program that I worked on was the extension was to educate physicians um, on the adoption of medical health records. All right, so I would go in as the government expert and say, here's this government incentive program, and these are the guidelines that you need to meet. Did you work with, uh, what company did you work with in the medical records? No, it was, um, it was a regional extension center. Yeah, so I founded my own medical billing company uh, back in 2003. Okay. So I had experience as a medical billing. Which medical records so did you the, work with? Oh my God, I worked with all of them. Uh, Cerner uh, was a huge one that I worked on. That was a huge project at Broward Health. Okay. Um, I I worked with um another one. Um, isn't Epic kind of taking? It? What about Epic? Isn't Epic kind of taking over? Epic is so Epic is huge. Um, Epic was normally relegated for um hospitals because they were big systems. Yeah. Um, they've gotten into every single you know out of one point it was over seven hundred. You're hearing you know, suppliers city, of medical the records. Takeover has been serious. Everything's. But is it solid. Epic or is it um no, uh, yeah. Optum? No, but like like it's NYU swept over like all the private practices or like uh, Cornell Pace swept up all the like doctor practices. It's not like so many like there's very few individuals running around. Like, are you one of those? And you know why? And you know why they do that, right? Because and you they, know why they do that, right? The billing and they also write and they're all on the same system. Well, so yeah. the, the big reason for it is that um, part of, um, oh, you know, like that, yeah. so they've basically created, um, you know, their affordable something organiz care organizations, ACOs. Yeah. And those ACOs manage the lives and Medicare pays that organization of per member per month. Yeah. So what they did is they took all these retired doctors, they bought them all out, they increased their census, and they got more money. And what you see now is we, we've literally gone back in circles. You know, we, we get we get away from monopolies and we open up business. And then 20 years later, we're right back to where we're yeah, at. They find another you know, way look, to do the same thing. It's just we yeah, go right back to it, man. Just, yeah, we go right they, back to they it. They play the reshuffle game. They just figure they, they yeah. regame the system. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. So back to the electronic medical records. At that time, the government was handing out, um, I think, sixty thousand dollars for Medicaid providers that would what would adopt. Okay. And you know, I think my first or second week, you know, I came back out on the field and I'm like, I was talking to the doctor and I'm telling doc, you're gonna get this. And his partner comes in and is like, yeah, we're gonna take the money, we're gonna go to Hawaii. And I'm like, no, that's fraud. You're not supposed to be doing that, All right? So right away, my manager's like, look, we're just there to tell them how to invest. Don't ever make any accusation like that. I'm like, no, that's fraud. <laughs> Literally every single doctor was taking that incentive money and spending out on other things except what it was for. Now, when I went to some of my contacts to talk about it, I said, dude, like I ended up quitting the job. Like I, I couldn't consciously sit there and do that anymore. And when I went to my contact in the government, he's like, we knew that this was gonna be a problem. We went to Congress and said, we need to enforce it and we need the resources and Congress turned it down. Yeah. And, and I think for me, that is something that I just cannot wrap my head around. And later on, when Florida created a task force to combat fraud, um, we went back, Office of Inspector General with his task force presented that for every dollar we spent combating fraud, we got seven in return. They asked for an increase in budget, it was turned down. Why does that keep happening, dude? You know? that. So to me, regulations and accountability are a big thing for me. And I think that's going to be my number one priority, uh, you know, when I make it up there. Is it's so frustrating. To, to make it? sure. I know. I know it, what you're it talking is. about. It's so frustrating. It is. It's so yeah. frustrating. It really pisses me off yeah. too. I totally can't. It, it does because yeah. every paycheck, there's a Medicare deduction there, bro. You know, that's fair. your money. It's, it's just not yeah. there. It's ridiculous. Yeah, 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 man. Yeah, it is. It is. So listen, it, it, it takes for us to be involved. Okay. Uh, more of us, I think our generation needs to uh, step up a little more. Yeah. I think so, uh, we're a little lagging <laughs> and so we need to do a better job. On your website, right, besides the um, anti-corruption stuff, which I, which I am happy to hear about, right? Um, I saw that you also talked about healthcare, but then you also talked about education. So what's your connection to the education? What's your ideas there? What's going on with that? Um, my connection is a, as an immigrant, um, you know, who made it as far as high school, not because of, uh, you know, because I was just some degenerate that didn't want to go to college, is, you know, during high school, I worked to help keep the lights on. And when I went to college, because I had earned more than seven thousand dollars like i got denied financial aid and that was my first you know rage against the machine yeah, because oh, yeah because uh. yeah, i here i am in a community college it's not like i went to um and enrolled it was a yeah. community college and you know i think three or four weeks into it i'm getting pulled out because hey your financial aid didn't get approved well i thought you said you had that taken care of well you made too much money but that went to keep the lights on man yeah. so that kind of shaped my life or the first part of my career um, in good ways and in bad ways because I know um, how much it hurt me not having and to this day still does uh, because, you know, people look at it as where's the audacity in asking for an $80,000 job or an $80,000 base with a high school education. Forget the fact that I've, you know, spent 20 years oh. earning that. The first, it, you're not getting past that computer because everything is, you know, now being done by, an, you know, an, an enterprise resource management system where an HR person who has no human social skills whatsoever checks a box because their boss told them, I need these qualifications. You can submit that resume all you want. It's not going to pass. So you're, you know, you're not, nothing is happening, dude. And for me, I think that's a problem. We've put such an emphasis on giving everyone a college education. That what the hell have we done with that college education? What has it done? It, has, exactly. it hasn't made things better. It's made things worse. I agree with you, actually. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah. you know, Asian Americans, we've been dominating since the 80s. Where are we in leadership? It's, it's a huge scam. It's a huge scam. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah man. We're, we're, and you know what the schools are doing with it? Just, just so you know, NYU is one of the largest landowners in New York City, right? And Cornell Pace actually just bought the projects, right? This has nothing to do with education. It's their financial institutions now. They're no longer educational they institutions. Are. They are. Straight up. They are. And they, they are. And, and I think anything, yeah. anything that is for profit, yeah. specifically as it relates to health and education, is morally, you know, abhorrent, plain and Yo, simple. You're in, the, you're in the tech field, right? Yo, yes. Information has become cheaper and cheaper. Open source, there's libraries, right? You go to look at... Absolutely. Um, you go to freaking, um, you know, like CDs, right? Or music, it's like so cheap now. But 
that education yeah. got more expensive. Exactly. They still hustling exactly. them books. It's a scam in a yeah. scam. It is. It's ridiculous. It is. Yeah. It is. So, it, is. Um, it is. Yeah. Especially when someone's going to school and ending up with a hundred thousand dollars school, uh, you know, worth of loans for a fucking history major. And, and you've been a boss. Like, what the, all the, what the fuck out were you there, thinking? Yeah, all the bosses out there, straight up, all the bosses. When someone came into your business and applied for a job and they were fresh out of college, how did that go? Oh, please. Come on. They had no experience. They had no idea what so, was going on. And none. Here, yeah. None, dude. And they thought. None. And it, how many of them walked in thinking that their degree made them worth something more? But, Absolutely. And uh, so the thing is that they worked less. So I would ask them like, well, when they, yeah, when they walked in the door, this is what I would ask them. I would say, what do you think makes this business the most money? And what do you think loses us money? Right. Do, do you understand the business at a fundamental level? Yo, the, right. the people who had who didn't have the college degrees, they would maybe think about it they, or they had thought about it. I could tell the people with the well, college they've been in the trenches. They've or, been in the trenches. They, they, they realized that, that they were you know, that, that they had to work for it. You know, what I mean, but the, Absolutely. the college degrees, they came in and oh, like I would say 95 percent of them never thought about it in their life. They were shocked that they were asked that question. They thought I have a degree. It's going to it's a free ride. No, motherfucker. This is business. Well, but but so then now you're t you, now you're talking about what I call an ideological riff. So yeah. you're a Gen X. We were raised by Cold War ideologues, where it, every, we were ruled with an iron fist. You know, you fucked up at school, you got your ass beat. You didn't get good grades, you got your ass beat. You talk back to your mom, you got your ass beat. You know, the majority of us now suffer from some sort of anxiety, hmm. depression. We're all fucked up, even though we 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 you know pretend to be somebody else on Facebook. There's a there's a, a facade, you know, while ignoring the general malaise that we've all experienced. So now you have an entire generation that said, fuck it, we're not going to raise our kids that way. So we've made our lives, you know, our children's lives easier. But then at the same time, so I'm in the automotive industry. I walk into a service dealership and the generational divide is the boomer with the millennials. Fuck Gen X. Nobody talks about us. So then you got the boomer saying millennials fucking suck. The boomers, you know, the millennials saying these fucking dinosaurs nobody's talking to each other and nothing's getting done ridiculous